and I'll let the people in. Go. Here they come. Here they come. Ooh. Connect. Go. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't get the Zoom to work. Huh? Haven't seen you in hours, Sam. Excuse me? Yeah, have, haven't seen you in, you know, what is it, a whole week? Less than a week? Maybe less than a day? <laughs> For me, it was a few hours ago. Yeah. Hello, I was going to say good morning, but it's not morning. So hello, everyone. <laughs> yes, um, we're not going to be teaching that long. Um, we're we're going to try to keep this to an hour tonight. I'm just sorry, we're going to have to end early. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I agree. Well, I am too, too, but... Oh, it life gets in the way. Is. I understand. Yeah, I've enjoyed it very much. I've learned a lot. Well, I'm glad for that, and uh, <laughs> hope that you'll come to other classes uh, that we put together in the future. I will. It's just difficult sometimes to get there. That's why I wish we had the capacity to have them all on Zoom, um, so that you know life can not always get in the way. Yes. Well, you know. Sometimes getting there is half the fun. I knew you were going to say that. And it's a good thing I'm not close to you because I would wring your neck on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Please don't. Suzanne, I have no doubt that you are telling the truth. But I live very close. So it's not an issue for me. It's too far to walk. But I, are you I threatening me, close. Suzanne? You're going to reach right through and... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like she's going to, so you best be careful. It's been a very strange day, so. And I was. Well, I, it's the not only over. thing in my tea. I'm sorry. A, a super, the only thing in my tea is a supermarket tea bag, some lemon, and some monk fruit sweeteners. So I don't have anything in there that's. Sadly, this is all me. So. Okay. <laughs> Suzanne, if it's you, it's fine. Thank you, Rabbi. No. Um, I have no idea what that means, but it sounded good. <laughs> it sounded good to me, too, which is pretty scary. Hey. Uh, well, hopefully some others will come along, too, but I am glad to have you with me tonight. Um, and I'm going to talk tonight about the neglected aspect of Judaism at least neglected over the long haul of history, which is Jewish mysticism. So first of all, what does mysticism mean? For my purposes, mysticism refers to the attempt to have an intense experience of God. And you imagine uh, the prophet Isaiah saying, Kadosh, 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 you know, hearing the angels say the whole earth is filled with his glory, right? That mm -hmm. sounds a little intense if you try to visualize <laughs> it, if you try to put it into practice, right? Um, most of us, we have what is called normal mysticism. Uh, the best way to describe normal mysticism is to talk about blessings, right? If you say hamotzi, right? How long does that take? Not very. Not very, right? How <laughs> intense is it as a religious experience? Not very. Not very. <laughs> right? Well, that's normal mysticism, right? The Torah tells us 
certain things to do, which may make us at least a little bit aware of God's presence on a regular basis. I mean, if you say blessings before you eat, after you eat, if you pray on a regular basis, you're going to do a lot of that, right? But it's never that intense, right? It's not so in intense that you're likely to have a, a you know, paranormal experience going along with it, right? The Torah tells us things to do. It doesn't necessarily tell us how to experience God. But some of us want more than what normal mysticism provides, right? Now, Christians may get that through feeling the presence of Jesus, right? You know, all we have is the Torah. You know? So in some sense, we understand the Torah to be the message of God, but that's not the same thing as feeling an intimate relationship with God. Right? Uh, I'll mention, by the way, that I, I think there are four other types of mysticism besides normal mysticism. And if you ever want to learn more about them, you could just pick up this book, A Kabbalah and Jewish Mysticism Reader. Right? So I have, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing the one hour version of the book tonight, okay? <laughs> it's, it, it's, you know, it's, the, and it's also the sort of book that you would not read in one sitting, right? You would, you would read maybe 10 minutes a night, think about it, pick it up again the next night, read another five minutes, and so on, right? But there are four other types of mysticism I'll mention. One of them is what's called devekut. Devekut means cleaving. Uh, and it's a core term for the mystical experience among um, uh, many Jewish thinkers. So for instance, you know the verse from scripture that says, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall be as one flesh, right? Well, to veikut, the, the word there is, you know, the same, the same root as de veikut. Um, <clears throat> Um, and Hasidism uh, has a lot of emphasis on devekut, on how do you manage an ongoing, regular, mystical, intense experience of God's presence, right? Um, it, it takes a lot of practice. That's the short answer. Um, uh, another term another kind of mysticism is what some of us call mainline Kabbalah. And let me just show you um, a, um, an example. This is a diagram of what most versions of Kabbalah consider to be the 10 Sfirot. Sfirot means emanations from God. So up above this diagram, way beyond anything we can comprehend is the infinite God, right? And God sort of, you know, sends down these emanations so that we can have a, a little bit more of a relationship with him. And, and different aspects of God filter down through the Sri Road. Whoops, I just lost the page. <laughs> Let's try that again. There it is. Okay. Okay. So the the last of the Sfirot is called Shekhinah, the divine presence. 
right? Shechina is a word that comes from the word shachain, which means neighbor. Right? It's as if, you know, just climbing into the lowest level of this, one at least has the feeling of being as close to God as you would be to your neighbor. I don't mean, you know, the neighbors that you stay away from, that you try to avoid, right? There's one in every neighborhood. I mean, you know, you know, somebody who is right there and there for you, right? Um, I don't want to go into detail about all the difference he wrote, but the higher up you get, the closer you are to the infinite God rather than to these aspects, emanations of God. But each of them, as you can see, has some um, <coughs> um, characteristic that we can relate to, you know, even though they're not ours, they're God's, we can relate to them because we relate to these. Um, just as an example, uh, Kabbalah can explain many different things, many different religious problems. So for instance, um, one of the big problems is the problem of evil, right? Why is there evil in the world? Okay, so here you are on this same line, you have love and you have judgment, right? Now, imagine, you know, you're a, if you're a parent and you are raising children, you know that you need both of these, right? What happens if you raise a person with no limits, with no rules? You're just, you know, you don't have power over your child. You just, you're just buddy, buddy, right? <laughs> How's that going to work out? Little too much love can be a bad thing, right? What happens if you have not enough love and too much judgment, right? Well, that will help you if you're trying to raise a little fascist, okay? Okay. Um, it won't necessarily teach your child how to be a loving person. And in fact, you know, many of the people who really tend to overdose on power in life are people who weren't raised with enough of this. Okay? Um, you need the right ingredients, but you also need them in the right proportions. Right? If you have all the right ingredients when you're baking a cake, but you don't put them in in the right proportions, you'll wish that you hadn't tried. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So at any rate, this is kind of the basic diagram for mainline Kabbalah. Right? Um, near that, but somewhat different from that is what you could call magical Kabbalah, which means not to get close to God or to uh, help serve God's purposes, but to sort of influence the cosmos, if you will, in a magical sort of way. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that that actually works, but it's a frequent theme in Kabbalistic literature. I think of it this way, you know, Jewish history has been filled with times when we needed more help than we got. What did people have to turn to? Well, if God wasn't helping, then obviously we needed something a little more forceful to get God the message that it was, it was time, you know? Either it was time to send the Messiah or it was time to, uh, you know, come down and redeem his people again, whatever, 
we needed. Okay? So fear is such a thing as magical Kabbalah, and it plays an important part in the literature on Kabbalah, even though it's not something you would ever want to try to practice. Uh, you've heard of the uh, idea of a golem, right? A what? I'm sorry. Every, a golem. Oh, yes. Okay. So, you know, a golem is something that's put together with Kabbalistic magic. It, it doesn't happen any other way. Um, so the last kind of Kabbalah I would mention is what's called ecstatic Kabbalah, uh, where you're really just trying to have an ecstatic experience of God. And so there are techniques that you might use. There are, you know, uh, permutations of the letters of the name of God that you recite over and over again mm -hmm. until you go into a trance or some kind of paranormal state. And then you just kind of drift into that ecstatic experience. Um, and it, and it's, uh, it's a kind of Kabbalah that has become a little more popular over the last generation. Um, you, you read about people in Israel doing this. Um, you read about, um, you know, it's like the next generation of the hippies, right? But, uh, but it is uh, something that uh, a lot of people seem to have an interest in. There is Jewish mystical experience, you know, certainly going back to the Bible, the temple was a place where many people intensely experienced God's presence. But the rabbis in general were very skeptical about any kind of mysticism other, you know, beyond normal mysticism. And I want to share with you uh, a text which hopefully will... Um, uh, I have a bunch of texts for tonight. I may not get to them all, but we're gonna we're gonna take a look at this first one. Okay. okay. This is about four rabbis who entered an orchard, but the orchard is code language, right? It's the orchard of mystical experience, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so they there's clearly one of them who's more advanced than the others. He's sort of the guru taking the others along for the ride. But it doesn't go so well for those three. Rabbi Akiba said to them, when you reach the stones of pure marble, do not say that it's water, right? Because if you have a misapprehension, when you're en route to the higher levels, right? You're gonna come crashing down, right? That's, that's the gist of what he is saying to them. But what happened to them didn't go so well. Ben Azai gazed and died. And of him, scripture says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. In other words, it's not because Ben Azai was a bad guy, or that he was doing something wrong. He just physically couldn't handle the experience and he dies, right? Um, or maybe he dies because he got where he wanted to go. He had this intense experience of mystical union with God. But the only problem with union with God is that you can't come back. <laughs> you just have to stay with God. That's not what most of us are going for, right? If not we're yet. interested in this kind of experience. We'd like to be able to come home afterwards, right? So that's what happened to Ben Azai. Ben Zoma gazed and was stricken, meaning that he went mad, right? And if him, scripture says, if you find honey, eat only what you need, lest you be overfilled with it and throw it up. <laughs> oh, um, imagine, you know, 
I mean, it, it's really very sarcastic. He says, you know, you took more of this experience than you could handle. Right? <clears throat> and so now uh, you are um, uh, a little off the track. Uh, Acher, meaning Alicia Ben Abuya, who, was, who became called Acher, which means other, because that's what they called him after this. They say he cut down the shoots. That's code language for he became an apostate. Right? You know, when somebody who studied Torah all his life becomes an apostate, you know, something really bad has happened. Right? Bad enough for an ordinary person to, to become an apostate, but for one of the sages, horrible, terrible, yeah. right? Only Rabbi Akiba departed in peace. Right? So the rabbis obviously were um, uh, a little skeptical about this sort of stuff, and uh, they they really did not want people to get too involved in it. They were fine with normal mysticism, with just feeling a little closer to God than you did when you weren't doing anything that brought you closer. Normal mysticism suggests that the purpose of fulfilling the laws of the Torah is to make us better people more ethical, more sensitive, more aware of God's reality. But many of the mystics say, this is not about us. This is not what, we're not doing this for us. So sure, might make us better people, but we're not concerned about that. We're interested in whatever helps God. That's the goal of mainline Kabbalah, because whatever God needs, has to matter a lot more than whatever it does for me, right? Um, wanna show you, oh, if, look, before I show you the next text, uh, you have any questions so far? Okay, um, Suzanne, if you remember coming to one of my mountain courses, uh, you may have seen uh, this text, Thing. It's a very lengthy text from the Zohar. Believe it or not, I have abridged it considerably. Right? Um, it's about an old man who expounds on uh, certain biblical verses and on the nature of mystical experience. So here's the tale. One night, Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Yossi met at the Tower of Tyre. They lodged there delighting in each other. Now, today you would think that was a little strange, right? <laughs> um, but that, that, that's, you know, I mean, there's a certain amount of homoeroticism in the Zohar from which this mm -hmm. is taken, because uh, it's about a bunch of men studying Torah together practicing mystical experiences and, you know, delighting in each other, right? Okay. Rabbi Yossi said, how happy I am to see the face of Shechina. In other words, this other person, because the sages all represent a, a portion of God. He says, for just now, the whole way here, I was pestered by an old man, a donkey driver, who kept asking me riddles the whole way. What is a serpent that flies in the air and wanders alone, while an ant lives comfortably between its teeth? Beginning in union, it ends in separation. Don't try to solve this, okay? Because okay. we're not, we're not going <laughs> to okay. What is an eagle that nests in a tree that never was? It's young, plundered though not by created creatures. Ascending, they descend. Descending, they ascend. Two who are one and one who is three. All right, is that a little more confusing? Uh-huh. Yeah, good. Who is a beautiful maiden without eyes? Her body concealed and revealed. She emerges in the morning and is concealed by day. 
adorning herself with adornments that are not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> really strange, right? Yes. All this he asked on the way and I was annoyed. Now I can relax. If we had been together, we, you know, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chia, if we had been together, now then we would have engaged in words of Torah instead of other words of chaos. Rabbi Chia said, that old donkey driver, do you know anything about him? It's like Rabbi Chia is maybe not sure if this person is exactly what he sounded like. And Rabbi Yossi answered, I know that his words have no substance, for if he knew anything, he would have opened with Torah, and the way would not have been empty. In other words, we wouldn't have just dealt with trivia. You know, sages don't want to sit and talk trivia. They don't talk about the playoff, the football playoff games. <laughs> they don't talk about, um, you know, the Australian right. Open and who won that. You know, they, they're just... They're, they talk Torah, right? And if they don't talk Torah, then the way is empty, right? So Rabbi Chia said, that donkey driver, is he here? For sometimes in those empty ones, you may discover bells of gold. Bells of gold is significant because that used to be what was on the hem of the dress of the high priest in the temple. So that's, that, that's where that expression comes from. And Rabbi Yossi says, here he is getting fodder ready for his donkey. They called him and he came over to them. He said, now two are three and three are like one. Remember that riddle there? Um, but, you know, the uh, two who are one and one who is three. Ah, so now he joined them and they, and two are three, right? But Rabbi Yossi doesn't get it. He thinks that this is more trivia. He says, didn't I tell you that all his words are empty and inane? Right? So now we have the setup. Right? He sat before them and said, Rabbis, I have become a donkey driver only a short time ago. Before, I wasn't one, but I have a son and I put him in school. I want him to engage in Torah. When I find one of the rabbis traveling on the road, I guide his donkey from behind. Today, I thought that I would hear new words of Torah, but I haven't heard anything. In other words, it's the other way around. Instead of Rabbi Yossi being disappointed because this other guy was talking riddles, this guy didn't hear any Torah from Rabbi Yossi. So Rabbi Yossi said, of all the words I heard you say, there was one that really amazed me. Either you said it out of folly or they are empty words. So which one is that? Said the one about the beautiful maiden. Right? The maiden without eyes. eyes. Uh -huh. So the old man opened. Now, usually when you have a Torah teaching in the Talmud or the Midrash, they say, well, you know, so-and-so um, taught or so-and-so said. The use of the word open suggests that this is there to be opened, right? It's available if you just open the door a crack, okay? He opened and said, and he quotes this verse from the Psalms, God is with me, I have no fear. What can any human do to me? God is with me, helping me. It is good to take refuge in God. And he says, how fine, lovely, precious, and sublime are words of Torah. But should I say them in the presence of those from whose mouths until now, I have not heard a single word. <laughs> Again, he's now turning the tables on them. Mm -hmm. But I should speak because there is no shame at all in saying words of Torah in the presence of anyone. Right? So he's kind of opening a shade to let in some light, uh, which sort of goes along with you know, 
whatever else he is going to teach. Mm -hmm. The old man covered himself. He opened, again, there's that word. He opened and said, quoted the verse, Moses went inside the cloud and ascended the mountain. What is this cloud? The one of which it is written, I have set my bow in the cloud. The story of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. We have learned that the rainbow removed her garments and gave them to Moses. Wearing that garment, Moses went up the mountain. From within it, he saw what he saw, delighting in all until here. The comrades came and fell down before him. And weeping, they said, if, uh, if we have come into the world just to hear these words from your mouth, it is enough for us. Because they recognize all of a sudden that they're in the presence of a mystical master. You may not have gotten that yet, yeah. but, <laughs> but that's because you don't know the code language. That's yet, true. Right? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. <laughs> Um, you know, you'll, you'll pick up a little bit of it. Um, the, so the old man said, companions, not for this alone did I begin to speak. For an old man like me doesn't rattle or call with just a single word. Human beings are so confused in their minds, they do not see the path of truth in Torah. Torah calls out to them every day, cooing yet they do not want to turn their heads. Even though I said that a word of Torah emerges from, their, from her sheath is seen for a moment and quickly hides away, that is certainly so. But when she reveals herself from her sheath and quickly hides, she does so only for those who know her and recognize her. So it is with a word of Torah. She reveals herself only to her lover. Torah knows that he who is wise of heart circles her gate every day. In other words, the, the pursuit is kind of a game of hide and see. Right? You're pursuing Torah, but only when the Torah knows that you are ready will she display herself to you a little bit. Right? So, um, what does she do? She reveals her face to him from the palace and beckons him with a hint and then swiftly withdraws to her hiding place. None of those there knows or notices. He alone does. And his inner being and heart and soul follow her. Thus Torah reveals and conceals herself, approaching her lover lovingly to arouse love with him. Okay, so this is the maiden without eyes. Remember that riddle? Right. The maiden without, she's without eyes because except for her lover, no one has seen her. That's the meaning of the riddle. And, and by the way, the idea of Torah as a hidden princess within a palace is found in rabbinic literature, but it also fits well where this is written, which is medieval Spain, right? It, you, um, you may have thought of the Rapunzel story in uh, this context, okay? So instead of a prince, the hero of the story is the mystic who pays attention, who understands when the Torah gives him a glimpse of her hidden mysteries. Of course, in this story, he's the one who is seduced, not the princess, not the, not the Torah, okay? Continuing, come and see. This is the way of Torah. At first, when she begins to reveal herself to a human, she beckons him momentarily with a hint. And if he perceives, good. If not, she sends for him, calling him simple. Tell that simple one to come closer so I can talk with him. As it is written, 
from the book of Proverbs, whoever is simple, let him turn here. He who lacks understanding. Okay? And as he approaches, she begins to speak with him from behind a curtain she has drawn, words suitable for him until he reflects little by little. This is drasha. Drasha is one level of interpretation of the Torah. It's like you know, the, um, the sermonic kind of interpretation, if you will. And then she converses with him from behind a delicate sheet, words of riddle. And this is Haggadah. Haggadah is another level of biblical interpretation, you know, ba usually based on metaphor. Once he has grown accustomed to her, she reveals herself to him face to face and tells him all her hidden secrets, all the hidden ways concealed in her heart since primordial days. And then he is a complete man. He's a real man. Husband of Torah, master of the house, for all her secrets have been revealed to him, concealing nothing. She says to him, did you see the hinting word with which I beckoned you at first? These are the secrets. This is what it is. And then he sees that one should not add to these words or diminish them. Then pshat of the verse, just like it is. Pshat is the simplest level of understanding, the face value meaning of the text. One should not add or delete even a single letter. So human beings must be alert, pursuing Torah to become her lover. Right? So, you know, this is a really racy story here, right? You know, she takes off all her adornments, right? And then he experiences revelation. Not like you're thinking, right? But revelation of Torah without any obstacle. He becomes a husband of Torah. Okay? Now, normally the term Baal Torah would be idiomatically translated as master of Torah, like a scholar. Okay? But here it, it understood stands the word Baal literally as husband, husband of Torah. So when you get this kind of access, you know, it's not just knowledge, it's also very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, um, the word pshat, has, it, it, well, it means the simple meaning of the text, but the verb can also mean to strip. Okay, okay it's not what you're thinking here, right? Again, right? It, you, you are stripping different levels of meaning from the Torah, and you arrive at the deepest level, the most mystical meaning of the Torah. Okay? The, the simple interpretation of the text is never lost. The words of the Torah remain as they were, but seen through the eyes of the lover, who has now had a new kind of revelation, um, you get new and infinite levels of revelation. And that's, you know, connected with the mystic's experience of closeness with God, and maybe even an infinite closeness, right? He now knows why nothing should be stripped from the Torah. Uh, every detail, every allusion to higher realms gives him a better glimpse of God. Uh, questions or comments up to here? I, I do have a question. Please. Uh, uh, so, so this looks like, almost like a couple's experience, right? So uh, it, it was because like all the people that study Torah at the time, and you mentioned something like that are men. And then they treat the Torah as a female persona, or why? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I 
I take it yours was a statement and not really a question. I, yeah, I do. Yeah, it's it's almost like well, like almost like a, a almost like I have to say that my a sexual experience, right? Like removing all the adornments and opening for 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 a, a woman, opening for a man, and it's yeah. Well, I, that's kind of surprising, um, actually. I, yes. I didn't think about that. So. Um, I don't know exactly how to explain this, but I, I will say that, you know, in a similar way, the erotic plays an important role in many Jewish mystical texts because it is the uncovering of a secret, of something that is only passed down very privately. Right? Kabbalistic secrets are not meant to be public, just as, you know, you don't display your body publicly, right? at least not in the way we're talking about here. So, yeah, it, okay. it's a frequent theme, in, and, and I have and a whole chapter about it in the book. Oh, okay. And it's, uh, um, this is a part of it right so this is a, based on a story so i'm i'm assuming this is throughout like like kabbalah is is the torah referred as a female uh, like a she well in kabbalah i'd say you know mainline kabbalah um I want to make sure I understood what. Well, I'm asking question. like this is part of a story, right? And that's a, a yeah. the Torah okay. is a no, scene, okay. but so I just me, wonder is throughout. Yeah. The this is about, you know, in Kabbalah, God contains both masculine and feminine aspects, right? So that picture that I showed you with the ten Sfi wrote, uh -huh. some of them are considered masculine, some of them are considered feminine, and the picture is not complete without both the masculine and the feminine. And feminine, okay. Right? Uh-huh. Um, it's an aspect of life that, it's not that the, you know, the non-Kabbalistic rabbis, the Talmudic rabbis, were uncomfortable discussing sexuality. They didn't always make the leap to applying sexuality to aspects of God as a mirror of human existence. One of the things you see in this text and, and really in a lot of mystical texts is the idea that um, what happens on the cosmic level is mirrored down here on our level and vice versa. Right? You know, if, if I would say a certain prayer in a certain way, in a way that, let's say, has an effect on me, I am, you know, I do that in order to achieve a similar effect on the cosmic level. Up in the Sphere Road, you know, in a way that helps God's purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, carrying on. So, this old man was silent for a moment. The comrades were amazed. They did not know if it was day or night, if they were really there or not. In other words, they were already in an altered state, right? right? Um, enough comrades, he says, from here on, you will know that the evil side has no power over you. I, and he gives them his name, Yeva Saba, have stood before you to arouse these words. The, the name Yeva Sava is an old um, uh, 
it, it really means, Sava means elder. And Yeva Sava was a relatively minor figure in the Talmud who lived in the third century. Uh, the, Torah, the, the Zohar itself is attributed to a second century save, uh, sage, um, uh, Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay? So he says, I have, you know, I've given you this power. I, you know, I've stood before you to arouse these words. Okay? They rose like one awaking from sleep and prostrated themselves before him, unable to speak. After a while, they wept. Rabbi Chia opened and said, he quotes a verse from Song of Songs, let me be a seal upon your heart, like the seal upon your hand. Not accidental, but that's from a book that talks about physical love, right? And of course, the rabbis interpreted it as a metaphor for the love relationship between God and Israel. But still, <laughs> love and sparks of flame of the heart will follow you. May it be God's will that our image be engraved in your heart as your image is engraved in ours. And so Yeva Sava kissed them and blessed them and they went. These guys kiss each other a lot too. Yeah, Suzanne. Yes. I'm making a comment going back, say, to the story of the, uh, the woman. Many of these stories, it sounds, are ones that were not necessarily entirely put together by the people they are credited to, but actually appeared in other places and they are reinterpreting them. Would that be valid for me to say that? Yes. There's a whole brand of scholarship that places the Zohar uh, as very much in the style of its time and place, 13th century Spain. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, I've, I've read a lot of stuff about that. Uh, some of it after, came out after my book. So there's really mm -hmm. not that much about it in there. But it, it's, it, it's a growing field of study. Okay. So here we are they, at the end of the story. They rejoin the leader of their study circle, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. They told him all that happened and he was delighted and amazed. He said, how fortunate you are to have attained all this. Here you were with a heavenly lion, a mighty warrior compared with whom many warriors are nothing. And you did not recognize him right away. You had no idea who he was. I wonder how you escaped being punished by him. The Holy One, blessed be he, must have wanted to, to save you. All right. Um, so this is, um, you know, just, it's just amazing that they even survived an encounter with such a powerful mystic. Right? Um, and that's at least the end of this, the part of the story that we're going to look at here. But in this particular text, we see many important aspects and principles of Jewish mysticism, right? You saw how this ordinary donkey driver proved to be anything but ordinary, right? So we are reminded by this that what is apparent and revealed is not necessarily real, right? There's a whole level of life that is concealed from us. And you know, hopefully we have a desire to see more than we see. An important part of the task of the mystic is to penetrate that veil of reality and perceive what is concealed. Um, another point, mystical interpretation of the Torah is the real deal. In other words, all those other interpretations, uh, that's fine, they're fine. But the deepest level of meaning is the mystical interpretation, which produces actual access to God, real, what they would call devekut. 
the mystical understanding of Torah includes a lot of symbolic language, all those codes that we haven't learned yet, right? And it contains multiple levels of meaning. Another very important point, the gap between human beings and God is an illusion. It's like the garments of the maiden, you know? Once they're gone, then you see the real deal, right? And the same thing is true with the distance between us and God. You can bridge that gap through, you know, advanced mystical practice. Uh, and mystical experience is transformational, right? These guys had an overwhelming experience, right? Changed their lives. Mystical experience is available, but it will change your life. It will transform you into something different. It, you know, it, it's a vehicle for higher consciousness. Some people are not interested in higher consciousness. Some days it's all I can do to get up in the morning. Right? So, you know, I understand if, if, if people are, you know, not really interested in higher consciousness, but, but it's there if, if you are willing to master certain techniques and certain knowledge. Um, okay, I have about 10 minutes left. So let me just say a little bit more. Um, Hasidism, beginning in the 18th century, is the biggest major Jewish mystical revival in our times. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to show you an early Hasidic text, which, um, you, know, it, you know, since you were talking about uh, the erotic in Jewish mysticism, this suggests a very direct connection between prayer or devekut specifically and sexuality. So here's, and this is from a very early Hasidic text, probably the generation after the Baal Shem Tov, but definitely uh, 18th century. He says, prayer is coupling with the Shekhinah, with the divine presence. Just as at the beginning of coupling, there is movement, so one must initially sway in prayer, right? You've all seen people shuckle when they're mm -hmm. daven, sure. right? This is what he's talking about. Afterwards, one can remain immobile and be attached to the Shekhinah with great devekut. As a result of his swaying, man is able to attain a powerful stage of arousal. For he will ask myself, he asks himself, why do I cause myself to sway? Surely it is because the Shechina stands before me, and this will cause him to arrive at great rapture. Right? Man, that's, that's a little sexy. But, uh, you know, you didn't know that shuckling had to do with that, right? That did not. <laughs> no, well, you know, at least this Hasidic author says... Self-chuckling. Said, says that what you do on earth has a parallel in the higher realm, right? The beloved on high, a true cleaving. Now, you know, now he was not saying, I think that, you know, shuckling serves a supplemented sexual impulse. I mean, he was just talking about the fact that there's, you know, that, there is a likeness between what happens down here and what happens up there. Right? Um, in Hasidism, by the way, the, the relationship between God and man is much more frequently expressed as the relationship of a father and the son than it is as, you know, a husband and wife. So, yeah, but, but this is, shall we say, explicit, okay? All right. Um, even outside the Hasidic world, there remain many Jewish mystical thinkers. Um, 
you've probably heard me quote uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who mm. lived in the 20th century, died in 1972. Yeah. Um, and he's taught a good deal about he, he, what he, one of his projects was to take Kabbalistic language and concepts and explain them without all the codes, without all the jargon, so that you didn't need to have all that extra stuff to understand. Uh, but this is, you know, one of the things he wrote about uh, mystical experience. He said to the Kabbalists, God is as real as life. And as nobody would be satisfied with mere knowing or reading about life, so they are not content to suppose or to prove logically that there is a God. They want to feel and to enjoy God, not only to obey but to approach God. They want to taste the whole wheat of spirit before it is ground by the millstones of reason. They would rather be overwhelmed by the symbols of the inconceivable than wield the definitions of the superficial. So, and then uh, last paragraph, the Kabbalist is not content with being confined to what he is. His desire is not only to know more than what ordinary reason has to offer, but to be more than he, what he is. Not only to comprehend the beyond, but to concur with it. He aims at the elevation and expansion of existence. Such expansion goes hand in hand with the exaltation of all being, right? So that, you know, if you really have that kind of mystical experience, you would have enough knowledge of God to where you would never do anything that would harm another human being. It would be exceedingly unlikely you would ever commit a sin, right? Because something of God has rubbed off on you. Now, that's, that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't mind if, you know, in my sinful state, if, you know, a little of God would rub off on me now and then, right? It, it wouldn't hurt, right? Right. But, you know, it's not simple. And um, it, it's, it, it's a challenge because getting into Kabbalah you already have to have a certain amount of background in the meat and potatoes of Judaism. And this story will tell you about, you know, Kabbalah as being the dessert of Judaism. So here is what the Zohar says. There was a man who lived in the mountains and he knew nothing about those who lived in the city. He sowed wheat and ate the kernels raw. One day he entered the city and was offered good bread. He said, what is this for? They said, it's bread to eat. He ate and it tasted very good. He said, what's it made of? They said, wheat. Later they brought him cakes kneaded in oil. He tasted them and said, what are these made of? They said, wheat. Later, they brought him royal pastry kneaded with honey and oil. He said, and what are these made of? And they said, wheat. He said, huh, I am the king of all of these, for I eat the essence of all of these. But because of that view, he knew nothing of the delights of the world. They were lost to him. So it is with one who grasps the principle and does not know all those delectable delights, the deriving, diverging from that principle. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more depth if you're willing to pursue the mystical tradition uh, than just, you know, the wheat. So, you know, these also, you know, might be 
different levels of biblical interpretation, just like we saw in the longer text from the Zohar. Um, but it's also really a critique of the rational philosophical approach to Jewish life, which by the way, was also very popular in medieval Spain. Um, and it suggests that, you know, if you don't see or experience the mystical meaning of Judaism, then you miss out on the energy that sustains it and that gives it life. And that, you know, you don't have to be orthodox to benefit from that. Uh, although I would suggest that probably more Jewish mystics now as well as before uh, are orthodox doesn't have to be so because there's a lot of understanding that is available um, to the rest of us. So questions or, or comments at this point? You're all in a paranormal state at this point? No, but there's a lot to think about and to uh, quote meditate on, to chew on. That's there's a. It's kind of an, an erotic meditative state <laughs> because that's the first thing that you think of. But I'm assuming that later on you get to the point where that's there, but it's not the major element. It's yeah, kind of the hook. Um, yeah. Um. The masculine feminine thing is a big hook, but ultimately it's all about helping God. In the mainline Kabbalah piece, it's all it's not about your own personal pleasure, right? It's about serving God's purposes. The rest is just, you know, the, the language and the metaphors which help you understand where it's going. Well, thank you all very much for joining me in Jewish literacy. Hope this has been useful for you and uh, hope that you will join us for future courses, whether on Zoom or um, in person uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you for being with us. It's going to be strange next Tuesday night. Uh, yes, thank you, helping, to, helping to... Uh, Keep all that which is invisible working and made visible for us so that we are visible to each other. Thank you again. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.